Hello, I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Today on Personally Speaking, I'll be joined by actor Nick Gelfus. Nick currently stars as Dr. Will Halstead in the NBC hit medical drama, Chicago Med. Please stay with us. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and actor Nick Gelfus joins me now. Nick stars as Dr. Will Halstead in the hit NBC drama Chicago Med. Nick has also portrayed Dr. Will Halstead in NBC's other Chicago set shows, Chicago PD and Chicago Fire. He previously held recurring roles in the Showtime comedy drama series Shameless, HBO's The Newsroom and the modern Western crime drama, Longmire. Nick has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Theater from Marietta College and a Master's in Fine Arts from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's been married for four years to his wife, Lillian Matsuda. He's here with us today to talk about his life, his career, and the values that matter the most to him. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, actor Nick Gelfus. Nick, first question is an obvious one to me. Uh, What kind of name is that? Nick, uh, so Gelfus is German. German, okay. So you're Nicholas Allen Gelfus. Are, are you German on both sides, mommy and daddy? No, a uh, little bit on my father's side, mostly my mom's side. My father is also Italian, so we have family. Um, his mom was uh, 100% Italian. Okay, it said in one of these uh, bios on you that you actually spent some time in a place called Little Italy? That's where I was born, in Cleveland. Um, no Ohio. kidding. Are yeah. you, are, are you a, a fond of Italian food? I love it. Okay. <laughs> my mom was, oh man. So, so the funny thing is that the, the running joke is that we're, we're, um, we want to be more Italian than we are, our entire right. family. <laughs> we certainly are. But I found out that I, I did a, um, you know, one of those 23 and Me's DNA tests. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like 13% Italian. I thought I'd be more than that. I thought I'd at least be like 25 or something. But um, I recently took a trip to Italy to see some of my, um, uh, where, where the, the town in which my family was from. Right. And uh, it's called Mutinero Domo. And we have a club in Cleveland that my family's a part of, um, MCC, uh, okay. the Mutinero uh, Citizens Club. Mutinero Domo Citizens Club. And I, anyways, it was just, it was beautiful. I, I had no idea that this, this town, which is not what it used to be. A lot of people have fled and it's, mm-hmm. it's a little, a little um, decrepit, but it's, uh, it's, it's so vast and beautiful up in the mountains. And anyways, it was just a really important I found out many years ago, I found out that if your grandparents were born there, you can apply. So I applied for a dual citizenship so that I could be both an American citizen and an Italian citizen. So I'm grateful that my grandfather on my father's side came over on the boat and uh, allowed me to have double citizenship. I mean, I can go there anytime and get on short lines for uh, passing through the airport. I, and then they speak to me in Italian and I look like, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm in big trouble here. All right, we're talking to Nick about Chicago meds. So let me start with this. One, aside from the romantic issues and the, the human dynamics of the show, uh, one of the things I love about it is it, it introduces so many medical, moral issues that, frankly, I know are out there, but I hadn't thought about. Uh, how does that happen, Nick? How does the show come up with these great ideas about real moral problems that people are struggling with in the medical community? So it's, it's our writers. I okay. Mean, they're, they're fantastic, first and foremost. But then the, the whole, you know, Dick Wolf is the creator. He, he also did Law & Order. And this is the second major franchise, which is just... It's spectacular. I mean, if, for someone to have one franchise in their life is a big deal. <laughs> He's got two. He's like King Midas. We joke around. But his whole concept was ripped from the headlines. So everything that's happened, um, he, he, we, we, take, we take it and spin it a little bit or try and, and put a new, um, a new touch on it to make it our own. But it always remains relevant. So we're staying up to date and current with everything. And so since we're a medical show, our writers go after um, all this current science, and um, and then it's their it's their job. What, what they do brilliantly is take two sides and justify them so well that you, as the viewer, don't know 
if there's not a clear like right or wrong sort of thing here. Right, it's, right. Everything is really, it's that minutia and those details that, that humanize people and say, well, yes, of course, this isn't something that should be done, but you can completely understand why they would. Yeah. And, and, and I, lo- I love that you use the characters, different actors, to take different points of view so that we can all see. No one can say this show has a particular bias because everyone's point of view gets in there, which I love about it. Yeah. Tell us about this guy, if you know anything about him. Uh, I'm, I'm so struck by the quality of the human stories, the empathy stories that Dick Wolf produces. Who is this guy? Dick Wolf is, um, you know, he's, he's a lover of first responders, I think, from the beginning. He's always wanted to shed light on the, the true heroes of our, mm-hmm. of our community and our society. And it's the, it's, it's the firefighters, it's the medical professionals, it's the, it's the police. Yeah. Um, and so he's, he's, I think he's always felt that there was a debt of gratitude he wanted to pay to them. And when you think about it, you, you know, the Marvels and the DC comics, there's, there's these superheroes, right? Right. But and, and, and on, a, on, a, on just a basic level, uh, without all of that, it's 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 these first responders. And so I think he's just dedicated all of his ability um, towards that. And it really it's it's relevant, you know, and, and, and in a sense with what he's done with this Chicago universe, though, which is fantastic, is he's capitalized on what already worked with law and order mm-hmm. and he's made one universe, which was never, which had never been done on TV <laughs> before. So we like, we, we broke television history here. He broke television history with law and order SVU. It, it, it's now the longest running lifetime um, uh, drama on primetime television. Amazing. Right. And so that, that's, that's his own um, claim to fame there. But then the Chicago universe is, is art imitating life. You, all these first responders interact on a daily basis and so our characters transfer over to one another. And it's just, and, and yes, at the end of the day, why does someone want to watch a show? You want to understand these people. It's the yeah. characters. You want to know how they interact. Are they relatable? That's it. And so it, there's always a spotlight on that, um, that human aspect, as you're, as you're mentioning. This Dr. Will Halstead that Nick plays on the show is uh, very likable. And then if you go online to look up Nick's story, Nick is very, very likable, and this comes from somewhere. I'm going to suggest that family of origin matters a lot. So could you tell us, your parents, in in raising you, what did they do right, Nick? Well, you know what? You're right. It does start with the family, and I think that that's kind of a – that's luck right then and there. I have no – you know, I don't get to choose my parents. I don't get to choose my family. (laughs) You're born, and that's pure luck. And what they did right, wow, a lot, actually. I also consider myself very blessed by the fact that it was such a positive environment. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents are still together. That's, that's, um, they, they remain together through my upbringing. That, that was a very positive thing. They always made sure, just little things like we always congregate around a dinner table. Mm-hmm. Nobody eats and, and, and you don't leave the table until you've, uh, you know, you've taken your plate and you've done your, you've washed your dish. But we, we would always congregate around the table and talk, talk about the day. Um, what, what else? Man, they supported everything. I, I grew up playing a lot of sports. So they came to every game <laughs> and were always there. And, uh, yeah, that's just uh, – looking back, you don't know how important that is until you have a chance to look back or, or yeah. you, you, know, you hear from other people and you realize, wow, that, I, I didn't know that was such a rarity. Right, right. Um, that love and everything. They did, they did raise me Catholic. Okay. Um, I'm no longer practicing, but um, I, I do believe that a lot of that foundation um, was essential and yeah. to just giving me a compass and a grounding of, um, of just values and morals that, uh, you, you know, they were passed on from their family. And so yeah. family was always kind of everything. And it still is, very much is. Um, the family, we always got together for the holidays. Um, a lot of Italian cooking, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just, it was, it was, that's what it was. We, and and my, my father always says, you know, your siblings, you're, you'll never, um, well, one thing he says about friends, he's always said, the ones you grow up with, you'll never have friends like that ever again. Right. So stay in contact with them. And your siblings are the most important people in your life. And just so, you know, remain, remain um, in, in touch with them because I, I unfortunately, but fortunately it's, it's sort of, it's the thing you do as an actor, you sacrifice, you have to 
I grew up in a very small town. Mm -hmm. After Little Italy, I moved to the country and we were in a small town. And then for me to go do what I want to do, I, I have to go to New York City. I, I lived in New York City for a couple of years and then I lived in Los Angeles and did the whole thing. And, and, and just, just, it's a very abnormal life actor, uh, being an actor, but you sacrifice being around your family that much. Yeah. And so I grew up with all of that. And then, and there were times where I was completely depressed because I was so far away from them. Um, we hadn't figured out FaceTime or Zoom yet. <laughs> um, but anyways, it is, it's, they did a, they did a fantastic job. My mother, um, you know, she, without going into many, much detail, she did not have, uh, she had a very dysfunctional upbringing. Mm -hmm. And to come from darkness and to have such light now, wow. such wow. a success. And so she's fantastic. And I know my father, me and my father had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. And his family, you know, his family became her family. And so it was just kind of a beautiful melding. And, um, but yeah, she's, she, you know, she, it was, it was a long journey for her to kind of um, work through what it is she grew up into. And so, but she is, she is the best mother you could ask for. And um, it, you could just, it, it, you I'm know. Gonna, I'm going to yeah. make sure I send a copy of the show to her so she knows how much her son loves her. <laughs> oh, man. I, any chance I, I get, I tell him. And, you, you know, it's just anniversaries. You always kind of, I mean, my parents, um, I don't, I, you know, I, my, my fault, but I think they've been married like um, nearly uh, late high 30s years and they're almost 40 years, if not 40, but they've just, um, they're a great example of a relationship and um, they've been honest. They, I, you know, here's the other last thing about it. They said I could come to them about anything. Wow. I could talk to them about anything and I did feel and still do that I can isn't that great? I wish every kid had that kind of relationship with their parents. For our listeners, um, when he plays Dr. Will Hostet, he has a brother who's on the police part of the Chicago syndicate shows. And uh, I mention that because they have a sometimes stormy but very loving relationship, very supportive, very protective relationship. How about your own siblings? Is that the same case with you, Nick? Have you guys always been mutually supportive? And when, you've, when you have a kid in the family who's very successful as you are, are they all behind you? Is there jealousy? Is there resentment? Tell us about your sibling relationships. Um, very healthy, thankfully. Good. And I was, I was, I'm the oldest, so then it goes my sister, Jillian, and then my brother, Vincent. And okay. I think growing up, and they've, and we, thankfully we could joke about it at this point, I felt the need to be a second parent, mm -hmm. and that was not <laughs> That was not useful. Um, I was also just a, a wild kid. Um, but now, my God, it's just, it's, um, yes, we keep in touch as much as um, we're able to. Um, I, I get home as much as I can. Working in Chicago right now, is the, it's, it's been the best for me as far as being able to get home quickly. Mm -hmm. New York or LA, it's just, it, I can drive very easily. And so Chicago, right. was, Chicago was never on my radar. It's, it's, it's New York, LA. That's what it was. Now there's a lot of other places an actor can go to work, Vancouver, Atlanta, all these places. But yes, I've been, my sister has had her third child. And so recently we socially distanced and I got to see this, this mm -hmm. beautiful boy. Um, but, but yeah, at this point there's no, no jealousy, not at all. They're a hundred percent supportive. Supportive. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, but also uh, there to, Remind me, you know, if I'm, if I'm floating into a reality that doesn't exist. But thankfully, my parents, um, I, I don't know. I really don't know how to explain it. I guess there's, there was just a grounding that came that I had, I had kept throughout the entire journey of being an actor. And it's just, um, you know, we laugh a lot about a lot of the stories or interactions. My parents get a lot of people coming up and saying, oh, my God, I can't <laughs> believe your son's on TV. I mean, that just must make you. And, of course, they're very proud. But, um, you know, um, but, it, but it, they it, keep it, you rooted, too. Absolutely. That's, a, that's a great gift. Um, Especially in this industry, it's important to be around people that can do that. A lot of people smoke, blow smoke up your dress, and then this family to remind you who you really are. I, I like that a lot. Now, a few moments ago for our listeners, Nick mentioned he's raised Catholic, but, you know, he's uh, not practicing. So I, I'm going to 
generously volunteer to change my parish to Chicago so I can drag his ass into my church. <laughs> and then we'll, then we'll get him back, folks. Now, listen, let me go to something very close to uh, family and your new family, the created family with Lillian. Uh, every week, Nick, I celebrate weddings, probably 100 a year. And to prepare for giving a decent homily, I say to the couple, look, I don't want this to be a canned homily. I want it to be about you and your love. So tell me, of all the people in the world you could marry, why is this the one? And they've got to write me an essay, each of them about one another. I don't know if you had a chance to do that or not, but if you did, of the billions of women out there you could have ended up with, why Lillian? So, man, you you know, it's hard to – that's a very difficult thing to put into words because sometimes – it's just something you feel and you yeah. almost can't explain it. That's part of it. But then of course there are things you can't explain. So I met her in New York city mm-hmm. and she's from Columbus, Ohio and I'm from Cleveland. So there was a commonality, uh, you know, a similar language, if, if you will, as far as how we were raised, we had a lot of things in common as far as she, family was super important to her as well. Now she's half uh, Japanese, half German. Okay. Um, and so she, this whole different um, culture was brought in, in, in front of me. And I, you know, as soon as I met her family, I just, I kind of I fell in love with them as well. We, it's just, I mean, it, it, it was definitely love at first sight type thing where it's like, I saw her at this bar and, and, and it was, it was this band that had started in Cleveland that moved to Columbus that went and eventually played in New York city when I had moved there and she had been there longer and we went to this music venue. So music essentially brought us together and she grew up with um, classical musicians as parents and her family. She plays mm-hmm. classical piano um, and loves to sing. And, you know, me being an artist, we, that, that's kind of where we first started uh, melding. And then, you know, a lot, obviously eight, 10 years later, we, we uh, a lot of things, I, I learned, we know a lot more about one another and, and she's mm-hmm. got a whole different plan for her future. But anyways, it was, I don't know, I just, I was drawn to her energy and, um, and how she held herself and she was being so generous with people. It looked like um, she was just made of money because she was giving everybody drinks. Now I know she wasn't. <laughs> I learned that she was not, but it was just, that's just the type of person she was. And, and just, a, a, just a beautiful light coming from her. And I said, oh, man, I have to meet her. Um, I, I'm feeling something here. And, and so it's that, that something that you feel before you even talk to that person was what drew me in. And of course, there was a f- physical attraction, of course. But um, a- after we got started getting to know one another, it's like she lived in Harlem. I lived in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And that's a 45-minute train ride. <laughs> right. Um, and I-, I took it as much as I could, and so, so did she. And so we, we realized that there was – there was a commitment there and a willingness to do whatever to, to see one another. And she would come and meet me. I was waiting tables in New York city mm-hmm. and she would come sit at the restaurant where I was working and just read and <laughs> have, a, have a beer or something. And I was like, wow, here's a funny thing. Her address was six, six, six St. Nicholas Avenue. Okay. And I'm like, and you know, six, six, six is the, I, what, <laughs> The devil's number, right? And I'm like, wait a minute. But is it, is it, is it uh, offset by the fact that it's St. Nicholas Avenue? And I just found that very funny. But, um, and, hey, uh, you know, rest is sort of history. We, uh, it, it's not that we didn't we, – we have not had troubles and, and have figured – Sure. And, and, but it's uh, why her? I, I just – you know, once you start, um, ex- you know, investing in somebody – there's just so much that that's uh, at stake then. And, and if you just feel like you can't live without that person. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, that, that, that says it all, Nick, you really are for a guy who says he can't put into words. You did a beautiful job just then. Oh, let, let, let me ask you very often. And now I'm getting to do renewal of hours for people who married 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. And when I say to them, what kept you together? No one is saying good looks or sex or money or power, but they're saying friendship. Is she essentially, the closest friend you've got in the world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. I want to tell her everything. You know, we may we may keep some things out of it, but um, yes, I feel like I can. You know, we've actually gone to, um, I, I, I'm an advocate um, for therapy. We've gone to couples therapy mm-hmm. and talked about things. Um, you know, uh, she lost a mother to mental illness. That was very difficult on our relationship. It was a very brutal um, 
death there actually. And so it's, we've been through quite a bit at this point. And, and I, I'll be honest at first, I, when we were getting married, I had reservations and that was a difficult thing to overcome, but we did. And I'm so glad we did. Um, the wedding was such a beautiful day. And, um, but there was all these, um, these little bumps and, and it's just like, they're going to be there, I guess, is the thing. And, and I, and I and when I was younger, maybe had a naive um, idea that, oh, when you find the person you have, it's, it's, you know, yes, you'll disagree, but it won't be anything too difficult. You'll be, and I, and I was wrong, of course. It's just a young, um, maybe a hopeless romantic uh, ideal. But uh, I, I love that you're speaking positively, too, about the value of therapy, Nick, and you've done this in other places as well. My parents' generation believed that, like, you know, if we can't solve it ourselves, it can't be solved. Or, uh, or you know, why would you tell some stranger problems? But I find it takes great courage and, and wisdom to have enough sense to realize we can't fo- solve this thing. And we need some outside help and get an objective point of view. And yeah. that y- you and Lillian have done that as a, a sign of great strength in your relationship, actually. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think she she would attest to it as well. Um, and, 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 you know, the f- funny thing about therapy is that a therapist doesn't tell you everything that you need to work on. They guide you through you. Right. So most right. of the time you're sitting there and they'll ask you questions and you'll think, wow, gee, I never thought about that. Well, you know, I guess, you know, that makes sense because this, this, and this happened. So you, they're really putting it on to you um, in this just it really supportive way, of course, they're there to, to help validate whatever you're feeling and, and everything, but they help you have these epiphanies. And mm-hmm. so some, you know, if you're not programmed to think a certain way about yourself, then they are there to help you do so. And, and I, I think, it, you know, listen, I, I for, therapy is, is just, I think, an important thing. Anybody could benefit from it. Right, and, right. Any, any shame in it. I really don't. Um, and you don't have to be depressed to go see a therapist. <laughs> right. Or, or, or you don't have to feel like you want to end your life to go see a therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, there's many, many, many reasons you could go. And uh, for an actor, you know, if I'm, if I'm supposed to play all these other characters, I need to understand myself so I know what I have at my disposal to use and what I shouldn't be using and know how to compartmentalize all of that. So I have to have a really good understanding of myself just to understand the human condition in general, but, but to know that I'm the vessel that I'm playing these characters through. Mm-hmm. I, need to, I need to have the best understanding of myself to, to figure out what I shouldn't bring to the table for this character because that's Nick. That's not a part of this. You know, it's just, it's a very interesting thing. In, in therapy, I actually figured out that an actor um, uh, needs to be okay with a little bit of abuse because if you're a dramatic <laughs> actor, you're, you're doing these scenes over and over, these emotional dramatic scenes over and over and over. Yep. Because so many, you do a wide shot, then you do a mid shot, then you do a, a close up. And your mind makes sense of the fact that this is my job. This mm-hmm. is what we do. We do different takes, but your body is still feeling like you're going yeah. through these emotions. Depending on how, uh, you know, rooted in the reality of, of it you are and how, and how you work, at the end of the day, it's like, um, it, you feel all this residue and you feel like you've been at a funeral all day, could feel like. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's really it's intense. It's very intense. And speaking of intense, uh, I'm wondering too, how do you stop it at the end of the day? Like there are, there are scenes in Chicago Med. Uh, you have me and my 100-year-old mother weeping or laughing depending on the scene. But I say after a particularly intense scene, how do you go home and like just pour a cup of coffee like nothing happened today? Well, you don't. Yeah. Um, you don't. And, and, and that, I'm glad you just asked that because it's a perfect segue in what I was about to say about therapy and what I discovered with the therapist that um, if an actor is supposed to take is supposed to be OK with a little bit of abuse, because that's what we essentially go through a little bit throughout the day. You um, the, the best tool this therapist said that I can give you as um, out of all my 40 years of, of, of teaching therapy is meditation. Mm-hmm. Because basically what, what you'll do at the end of the day is you'll quiet everything down. Um, you'll return to a, like a, a, a base and sort of get rid of any lagging thoughts or any residue from w- what just happened. That's a perfect way to end the day. Nick Elfes has been our guest. Uh, I want to thank him for coming on Personally Speaking and say that uh, uh, through, I guess, four or five seasons, my mom and I have 
I've been part of that Chicago Med uh, group, and it's just one of the best shows on television in that it uh, truly addresses so many of the medical moral issues that we face. It faces, too, uh, really human struggles to to love, to understand love, to understand service. Uh, one of the things Nick has said in other places, and he repeated today, is uh, we don't need we, we, what we need to do even more is to celebrate people who generously give of their lives uh, to improve the lives of others. And uh, people in the police force do that. Firefighters do that. And through Chicago Med, we get to see the medical profession is is life saving, life affirming, and thank God they exist. And I think through the pandemic, we've especially come to appreciate that. But Nick. Uh, has appreciated that for a long time. Nick, thank you so much for, uh, I have to tell you many times when I do these interviews, people have kind of a, a canned response. I don't think you're capable of a canned response and that's a compliment. Uh, <laughs> you're a wonderful man, wonderful actor. God bless you and your family. And uh, I'll uh, promise to uh, stay in touch to, uh, to, to convince you that there is a heaven and I'm gonna get you into that heaven, all right? Okay. <laughs> I need to say thank you for your support and watching the show. Um, you, it's, I just, uh, you know, I, you keep me employed and that's okay. <laughs> I, I believe people's, um, our time is one of the most important things we can give one another. Yeah. And, and essentially you have been, and I didn't even know it till today. And so I, I thank you so much. And Bless your mouth. It's a pleasure. <laughs> that is some of your oldest supporters, 100 year old Cecilia. Thank you again, Nick. And God bless you. God bless your mom. And, uh, and good luck with Lillian, too. All right. Thanks a lot. As we end today's program, I want to thank all of you for being with us. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can send them to me through my website, which is www.closeencountertv.com. All one word closeencountertv.com. To listen to our Personally Speaking podcast with some of our most recent shows, please go to YouTube and search under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti and subscribe. Personally Speaking is also available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, iHeart, and Spotify. You can also listen to past episodes by going to www.ollmp.org. Ollmp.org, and you get not only recent shows, but also Monsignor Jim's weekly homilies. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, personally speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jadovitz, and thank you all so much for being with us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.